Welcome back, everyone. Today's guests are Laura Jumier and Lucas Clayman, founders of Menutech, and to dive into how good design sales saves on development and increases the general lifetime value of your SaaS. We'll also touch on the life as married founders since they've been running projects and businesses together ever since they met. Laura, Lucas, welcome to the show. Hello, Victor. Yeah, it's good. Thank you for coming. Um, let's start off with uh, just a little bit of a background uh, about you uh, and in your business. Um, what uh, as entrepreneurs so far? Yeah, sure. So, uh, yeah, my name is uh, Laure Jumier. I'm the CEO of Menutech, and I am a UI UX designer by training. And yeah, my name is Lucas. I'm the CTO of uh, Menutech. I've uh, been on the tech side of life for, uh, yeah, probably well over a decade now. And uh, that's how we roll together. That's awesome. And so you've always been a developer, is that right? Uh, correct. I started uh, so from university more on the business side, but I've uh, ever since uh, transitioned towards uh, software development, software engineering, and um... yeah, all the likes, right? Hmm? Yeah, that's pretty much it. Yeah. Well, what else have you done? <laughs> 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 yeah, so similar to similar to some of the of our predecessors on this show, uh, Laura and I have uh, also started from an agency background. We basically ran like entire tech and marketing for different startups. Uh, we accompanied SMEs in their digitization, uh, but we also navigated corporate environments, especially in the automotive industry. Built a lot of internal apps and services. Um, I think one particularly cool project that Laura has worked on was a Call of Duty style task management um, solution for shop floor workers in uh, in automotive factories. So it's yeah. it's been a pretty sort of broad and diverse uh, journey to get here. That that's awesome. So you've you've found your together and. Uh, when did you take the leap towards, hey, uh, I think we, there's, there's a software here? <laughs> yeah, doing this for a couple of years, we, we naturally developed a drive to build our own product, to shift away from this project work towards a recurring revenue business. Mm, naturally, we started with the sector that we were, that we felt most passionate about. Uh, which is businesses who serve food. Uh, we started in the niche of food information uh, for food service businesses. And over time, we have transitioned to focus on uh, the healthcare market, developing into a leader in the food service ERP space. Uh, we now mostly serve hospitals and care homes, uh, most in Europe, but also uh, US and Canada. So what, what does Menutech do uh, for, for these businesses? We basically solve the, the problem to effectively run a um, teamwork in, uh, across different teams in the food service. Uh, we enable uh, personalized nutrition for every patient in hospitals and care homes. So it's the whole process from what meals to offer, who are they suited to, uh, to displaying this information, collecting orders, uh, putting together procurement, everything that you need to run a food service operation. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Cool. And, uh, and that started, as you said, is that with smaller companies and now moved over to more of the enterprise sector that get that correctly? Absolutely, yes. Uh, we've been starting mostly with hotels, but pretty pretty soon we've uh, transitioned to healthcare groups um, and then uh, more healthcare enterprises with multiple sites, large teams uh, working together across linguistic barriers. I think that's something that we do particularly well and we excel at. 
Awesome. Yeah, I, I I know your your background, of course, uh, and and you 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 feel very well in that in that sort of industry and sector. So that's that's fitting. And but but it's it's very amazing to see that you then moved upstream towards the bigger deals, the bigger clients. Once that was validated, so I think that um, want to achieve, but then find themselves trapped with like a very Position, very, very concrete pricing model. How did you how did you accomplish that? You, did you have to make any major changes, or or did that just fit those bigger companies as well? Well, what kind of did that? Like the um, the value that we delivered was multiplied, right? For a large organization, especially in healthcare, right? The core, so to speak, for the software is to produce food menus, but of course for a for a patient, you're going to have to do food menus, breakfast, lunch, and dinner every single day. There's no weekend break or anything. Uh, so the software was definitely more intensively used. And then I have to say, just it came from our customers, really, that they had ideas of uh, how to kind of build a whole universe around this whole um, menu planning. Uh, and that's how it quickly expanded from there. But I'd say it came from our customers, really. We, nice. we were really listening to them. And being receptive to their feedback. That's that's very good. Um, so, well, our our main topic, and that's what I really want to dive into here with you guys, is design driven. And um, a common phrase in the startup world, especially with bootstrappers, is uh, true validation uh, is when you build something ugly and people still use it. That's that's when when you know you you got something there. Uh, would you would you agree or disagree? I won't disagree, <laughs> but I will also say that that's not what you should be concerned with uh, if you're at the stage of product validation. Uh, what you should be concerned with is good design. And good design does not have so much to do with the aesthetic quality of your software. Uh, what it has to do with is the convergence between convenience and rel reliability uh, for your users. So what you want to achieve is that your software is uh, easy to understand and that it matches the expectations. And once you match those, those two factors, you have a good design and this good design is the bare minimum for product validation. And then once you expect, uh, sorry, once you um, when, once you, you surpass those expectations, so you're not just convenient, you're like self-explanatory, and you're you're not just reliable, but your software kind of overtakes the thoughts of your users. Uh, then uh, you have not just good design, you have great design, and then you can. Call, use design as your USP, uh, and uh, and this indeed you can concern yourself about that at a later stage in product validation. Mm -hmm. And I think maybe to even backtrack a little, um, because I, I think a lot of founders, especially without a design background, um, may what in your definition is even design? Because what you said right now obviously means it's not about the bells and things like that. No, it's true. Uh, so there is uh, two uh, worlds meeting in the word design, and I think that has to do also a bit with English language. Uh, product design, you can both refer to the process, the iterative process in which you collaborate with different teams and build a product, build a software, or you can refer to the end result, the actual sort of um, end result, let's say, of building that product. And uh, yeah, this and this this is where you have to decide, and you have to be specific or to specify really what what you're referring to. To make sense, and um, so you said for 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 a validation, it is enough to be uh, reliable to to solve the need. And so that's what you're aiming for during during validation prototyping cycle. And but once you have validated something, how would you how would you step that up? What what is 
then to add more or, or better design or make better decisions even during product development. Or if you want to take this or um, the way I, I see it is that what you need to, it's back to this core principle, let's say, of product design is that you need to be user centered. And that word has been overused, but I'm going to bring it up. Um, and really, <laughs> one thing you need to remember is that you're using a technical tool for a non-technical audience. In our case, right, we're not an API-based business model. We're not a B2D. Uh, so our audience is a non-tech audience. And so really, what to really remember is that you're using non-human tools for human problems, to solve human problems. And so you just have to remember to be human and just be in touch, really, uh, with what your, your customers uh, need and what their problems are. And that, that beautiful moment where you go beyond matching their expectations and where you're surpassing their expectations, this is, this is really through iteration, through uh, really just being there for your customers. A lot of domain-specific uh, expertise really helps. Um, this is where uh, you got to go also by that bootstrap rule of doing things that just don't scale. And you have to go and meet with the customers, be there either on the phone or literally just like buy a flight ticket and go there and see how they're using your your software, see their everyday life and and be on the same team as them in solving their problem in an efficient and amazing way. Yeah, yeah. it's great. And it also ties in into uh, two topics we, we've already had on the show, which is user journey mapping um, as well as UI UX testing, which I think if anybody's interested, listen to the two as because that that really also gives a specific tool belt um and so uh, speaking of getting feedback from customers how how do you uh do that what, what's your tool belt here specifically flying over uh any any interviews and things like that yeah i think yeah, we've been extremely traditional on, on that side. Uh, you have to see people face to face when you want uh, real feedback. Uh, I think it is extremely difficult to implement this uh, in a um, digital and scalable way. That's why we've been uh, flying out, meeting customers, especially when being exposed to a new context. Uh, when we entered the um, long term care or care market, uh, we had no idea how a care home looks like. Uh, we have never been in one. We have no relative who is. So our way was really to fly out to, to customers um, and uh, accompany, them during the, accompany them during the lounge and uh, really learn uh, what the needs are on the ground. And as Laura was saying, those are things that don't scale, uh, but they will give you the edge over your competitors to deliver a product that is uh, truly outstanding then of course that's like that would be at the beginning afterwards like you you train your um your sales reps you train you know you want your account executives you know to really be there to be receptive to have those um this good communication with the clients uh you can also to a certain extent rely on some good tools out there that can monitor the activity you can uh, calculate you can you know you can forecast when people are less engaging with your software but indeed at the very beginning especially in you, if you're in this prototyping validation stage do things that don't scale mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 100 percent um and especially since lately everybody's been speaking about product-led growth and product-led growth only uh where the goal obviously is to to completely minimize any human interaction there possibly is uh and I think that, that, that is a very good thing that is where SaaS is going in the end. And if you can make a product in a way that it really is so self any help, that's perfect. Yet in order to get there, I guess that's what people don't understand is for a lot of times is yes, taking people out of operations is fine, but on how to get there, you, you do need to interact with customers, even as far as, you know, buying a plane ticket, even if it's for a small customer, because they speak for their entire customer base, I suppose. Um, yeah, I can give you a story like, like, I think uh, it's very concrete. 
but for me that just works every time in terms of in terms of empathy in terms of just getting it <laughs> what they need um is using your software on your customer's computer <laughs> uh and you'd be surprised like especially uh, if you have a non-tech audience so i'm sure for all the listeners today uh their computer is positioned in the most beautiful room of their house of their apartment and it has like the best chair um <laughs> it has all the accessories you know because we are it people so our computer is just it um and then i can tell you i visited this one client of ours and one thing you need to know about gastronomy teams like professional gastronomy they um so they, they're also going to be the chef the sous chef the plongeur and then they all work in this mega room and that's where the magic happens the food service right and then they have I think can be considered one of the loneliest jobs ever. It is the chef pâtissier. So he's the guy making the desserts and he's all alone in a room in the dark, always cold. Um, and it's sort of like far away in a sad corner. And I swear this customer, the room where they had their computer was behind the chef pâtissier. So it was in an even lonelier, even darker, even less natural light room. Um, and then that, you know, that humbles you. You know, you remember that the obsession with IT is something very specific to people who love building tech products, but not necessarily those who use them, who will, who will use yours. It's the, oh, I didn't test this in Internet Explorer moment. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> nice. That is a very, very good story. Um, so who... Who is on on your own product team apart from you two? How's that? How's has that evolved over time? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we are a product team of uh, six uh, at Minitech. We're distributed across front end development, automation testing, uh, back end engineering, and uh, developing marketing assets. Um, and uh, yeah, in our staffing, we were. Well, supported by Victor, so by yourself. <laughs> <laughs> and literally since day one, I mean, uh, Victor, we met at the shuffleboard uh, bar in Berlin, uh, where we, yeah, <laughs> we haven't even started out. Uh, so back then at T0, I think staffing was one of our main, uh, main concerns, finding the right talent, uh, matching it um, into the right team. And uh, yeah, I think your, your support has been, you know, elementary for us to, to get where we are today. Wow, thank you. And now you are six people. Also, congratulations. That, that, is, that is quite a very nice team for, for a bootstrap SaaS company. Um, so uh, it's, it has been fun. You guys over the past years. Um, how do you work within that product team? Do you have a specific like scrum or, or is it with less process uh, what, what works for you guys mm, yeah we i think we're in our tooling quite uh, traditional uh, we use uh, scrum we are a distributed team now since uh, the whole corona uh, kicked in um to so myself i'm a developer i take responsibility for the product team um, operationally, I take care of system architecture, integrations, DevOps, uh, but lately I've been shifting a lot towards technical sales, um, especially on an enterprise level, uh, where my involvement becomes uh, increasingly important. And that's where you, know, you need to rely on good uh, processes, good knowledge management, uh, that people keep uh, aligned on, on your mission, that uh, also people feel um, you know, valued in their, in their role that, that they're working at. And I think that's, uh, I think, really important to establish early on. Um, I think right when you start uh, building your, your product, uh, you have to really make sure to, to undergo the necessary iteration cycles, but don't undergo them with the same person. Um, so that's, that's why I always say that you need to have a couple of iteration cycles before you even write your ticket. Uh, because if, if you let a developer uh, redevelop the same feature uh, five times in a row, uh, you're going to burn out the developer, uh, you know, morale will be low uh, and, and really you run in, you run the risk of developing a low code quality environment. Um, people think that what they do doesn't doesn't really matter, will be changed anyhow. And uh, I think this is also my most important, um, I think the, the most important part of my my job as a CTO is to keep everyone aligned on, on what we do, keep everyone motivated 
and uh, you know make sure that we can undergo those those feedback cycles, those iteration cycles, without um, burning out every of our staff and team members. Mm -hmm. That that makes a lot of sense. Because obviously, iterating on, in code is the most expensive way there is. Uh, iterating in design is also not cheap, but way faster. Uh, so that's what you actively do. Ab absolutely, uh, I think this is one of the things that I'm uh, most aware of uh, all the time. Like, what are the iteration cycles? Uh, you know, how fast can we iterate with a, of a given process? Uh, and then, I mean, with a given technology and given team. So I think choosing the technology and the platform, it, it naturally implies a certain uh, velocity. And uh, most of the time, like when you are, you know, when you're starting out with your product and software development will not be the right answer. Uh, so I'm saying that as a developer myself, um, there, there are better ways, better tools. Uh, and that's where I think being design driven is, is so important. Having a, a designer on board early on, it really helps you. You can fill out those gaps. You can um, speed up the iteration cycles. I mean, especially when you're selling larger tickets, I mean, you're going to end up selling things that don't exist yet. Uh, so you have to sell them. You have the sales cycle. And as the sale materializes, you start building the product or the feature, the module that you, that you need to deliver on this contract. And throughout that process, you need someone to fill in those gaps. And I think those gaps are certainly not developers. Uh, I think in the most cases, uh, what works best is you know have uh, designers fill this gap to uh, to get you to that to that point. And also, if I may add, designers are good at this. Like, if you have a classically trained designer, if I could call them this way, uh, they will not be afraid of uh, a lot of repetition, a lot of you know delivering a lot of design outputs in a very short time frame. Uh, really, when I look at some relatives and friends who studied fine arts, the kind of deadlines that they have to fit, uh, really having to design your entire software suite against an unbeatable deadline is really, don't worry. You can give them the challenge and they will thrive in this environment. There will get uh, a lot of assignments after this podcast. We, we apologize in, in advance. but. Um, I think this is a very, very valid point that, that you, in my, especially last year when, when demand on, on the software development, very, very, very high in terms of the need for developers. But since last year, it has incremented, it has extremely increased. And, um, I, I do believe. People could save a lot of manpower, a lot of iterations, if they focused more on the design stage. Uh, again, not saying that designers are good designers are less expensive or, or uh, less uh, demanded because it's just as hard to find a good designer, but they can just so much faster. Uh, and uh, the results are, are just magnificent. Whereas, just as Lucas said, if you ask a developer to rewrite the same feature for the tenth time, they will. Um, so, <laughs> this is what's what's happening. Yeah. And I imagine you do this, and then you say, "Well, actually, the client didn't buy it. You build it for nothing." Oh. <laughs> exactly. There's nothing worse for development morale than that because in the back end you've already optimized algorithms tried to cache something tried to fix things and uh, then you have to do it again um but yeah so uh, that really ties back being driven again what should a founder learn who wants to become more design driven who wants to take advantage of that what should the skills be how should they refocus so, I mean, there's a short answer and a long answer. So the short answer is, is what we were talking about earlier. It's like, don't forget to be a human. So remember that you're building a, a, a technical product for a non-technical person, a, a non-human tool for, to solve a human problem. Uh, and sometimes it's keeping it that simple that will allow you to kind of be design driven in everything you do. You know, keep it simple so that you can have a maximum impact in all your decisions. The longer answer is um, take um, a designer co-founder. 
uh, we're great people, we're friendly, um, and we, uh, we're good in this sort of, um, like it's literally our job to work on a blank canvas. Like literally when I open my work tool and I'm starting, it's literally a blank canvas. So when you start a new uh, venture, a new company, a new startup, it is a blank canvas. So we're not afraid of that. Uh, and we will be a great collaborative person with development, but also marketing and sales or business development. Uh, then you can also count on us to deliver a lot of those uh, design outputs that you need a lot at the beginning and you need to iterate a lot at the beginning, whether it's a brochure, a sales pitch, a mock-up or all this. Uh, so we're going to have a good throughput. And, uh, and finally, uh, once you have a, a good designer who's thriving in this environment, they tend to then become the perfect person to become a product manager once your work day starts to get more settled and more sort of um, predictable. So you will win a great product manager after you have a good designer uh, co-founder. So you, they, will, they will accompany you throughout the journey. Mm, which is a very valuable. Some of the best product managers be designers, well, particularly for the reason because the goals are very much aligned with both roles. Mm -hmm. And you'll tend to have senior designers are those who, the difference between a junior designer and a senior designer will be uh, the amount of lifetime a designer has been exposed to a project. So typically, if you're just involved before launch, then you leave. Um, you'll be more on a junior role, but if you've seen how your product does in front of customers and you've iterated it, et cetera, et cetera, this is how you gain in seniority. And that's why, uh, it's, it's a perfect step to then become a great product manager. Hmm, this is great. Like your advice on hiring design, design co-founder, which is very uncommon if you look at the startup space everybody wants a technical co-founder but then they expect from them exactly what you just said a designer would be doing uh to listen to the customer uh, iterate frequently uh and uh obviously in the beginning be super scrappy but then make it scalable uh to thousands of customers the same person uh and build a team um which is something that you know uh not every this is this is a technical person to be on a very broad spectrum and uh not that many people who who are and everything involved whereas you just, just said you described this is more what what designers do actually around. very uh, and then you know exactly what you need to build and you can hire developers I love this advice. Um, and uh, I think that that is a very good summary of, of, of this of this design thinking part. And um, so let's move on to. Um, no, I just want to make sure, like, is there something that you think you uh, you wanted to, to add or. It's fine. We're good. We'll move on to the next part. Yeah. Very good. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I, I didn't want to cut off anybody here. Wonderful. Um, no, the the second part I I wanted to chat about because it's I think it also aligns uh, with our audience. It aligns with uh, who our listener listeners are and what kind of businesses. And uh, that is about being founders uh, together uh, as a as a couple, even as a married couple. Um, which a lot of people I think do a lot of people, others would never want to have met enough of those as well. Um, so that, that certainly is a very cool topic. Would you call menu tech a, and I know this phrase has been overused over the past decade as well, ever, ever since the, the four hour work, but, um, would you say that, that menu tech is a lifestyle business? Do you treat being an entrepreneur? like being a, a lifestyle? No, uh, I think as a simple answer, uh, we identify as a, as a product driven bootstrap SaaS. Uh, the property of our founding team being that we're a married couple, uh, it's not been a defining feature for what we do. Um, I mean, it, it has certainly made a lot of things 
easier, um, but it does not shape who we are. Uh, it's one of those, I think, founding uh, combinations that can work very well um, in the right circumstances with the right people. That's, that's awesome, because I think at the same time, even though you might not call it a lifestyle business, it still enables exactly that kind of a, a lifestyle uh, when you're not tied to certain locations. Sorry, apologies if I <laughs> interrupted your question. Um, but I would not agree, actually. I don't think that being a, a couple founder or married founder means, you know, sort of, makes it easier to, to, to be a lifestyle business. At least my way of understanding lifestyle business is that you will uh, voluntarily cap income uh, by limiting the work effort in order to shield a free time. And to me, that is only possible in an industry where the revenue model is uh, entirely project-based and, and where you have 100% control of the projects you choose to take in or not. And that's why I would associate lifestyle businesses more with a creative agency or freelancer style. Again, it doesn't mean that every creative agency and every freelancer is a lifestyle business, but I think that it's more in this type of revenue model where you can exercise a lifestyle business. I think like being a couple is not one of the factors that make it happen in any way. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That, that, that's super interesting. Love this, love this insight. Uh, since since when have you been working together uh, so far now? Uh, we have a long history of working together. Um, I mean, going back to university when we first yes. met, uh, whether it be for sort of student assignments, uh, projects, um, you know, later on uh, in the agency, and then uh, you know when we started Menutech in 2018. Uh, so I think we've always been very. Uh, close knit in our collaboration, um, very complementary. I think what uh, probably defines us the most as a team is that we have a very divergent uh, approach to thinking and problem solving. Um, I think that that kind of mirrors this uh, design development um, contrast where uh, Laura is, is the horizontal thinker. She thinks about uh, everything from, you know, not just the software, but, you know, where people use the software, in what context, with whom, what is their mindset, um, and, and builds uh, entire systems around the product or family of products uh, to deliver this experience that the customer is, is looking for and eventually is, is paying for, where, Myself, in contrast, uh, I exercise mostly vertical thought. Um, I try to think problems from A to Z, uh, to, to think in depth uh, about all their interdependencies, to create a logically coherent system. And I think those, those approaches are entirely divergent, uh, but this is exactly uh, what, what makes a good team, in my, in my opinion. I, I see it so often, and I think especially to, with, with couple founders, the danger is it's probably more aggravated where uh, people tend to found businesses together with those people that they are close with that often are similar to each other. And I think this is a very dangerous uh, path. If, if you're founders with too much of a similar, not just skill set, but mindset and mentality, then it may be hard to, to build uh, sort of sufficient um, like resource acquisition capacity as, as, as a team. Mm -hmm. Also because find your distinct roles within the business and you almost try to compete within that your one specific area or how do you see that? Yeah, ab absolutely. I think in, in our case, we have a clear area of competence. Um, I see this in every uh, well-functioning um, team that uh, this has to evolve, uh, be it um, explicit or emergent, uh, where defined by your skills and the times that the time that you can devote to, uh, you know, to certain tasks, and uh, that that will give you leadership and competence over over that area. And um, I think for us, always we had a very open style of communication, and especially as a couple, I think that's something that you can probably train uh, that working. Uh, and talking about work is entirely uh, different from a private conversation. 
um, and where you know you have to be able to express feedback. Um, we do that a lot, um, especially after uh, conversations with customers where we feedback each other, uh, we analyze the situation and you know, build, build lessons for um, you know, all those situations that, or similar situations that, that, that will arise. Mm, and I think that's, that's something where you, know, you can build uh, capacity together and that it's, uh, it, it may be easier as a, as a couple because you also have just more time in the day to, to create those moments to exchange feedback and to um, yeah, build, build this capacity together. So that, that sounds a little bit, and, and that probably is, is exactly true. Like if you, if you step above and look at yourself as a team, um, hire both of you within your company, and that makes sense, irrelevant of are you or not, then that, that, that might work out. And if that happening just in general, uh, personal things, but simply because there, it, it doesn't make sense for the business, then that will be hard. Is, is that kind of it? That's a good rule. Um, even though, you know, every couple is different. I'd say that every business is different. Every founding team is different. So it's difficult to kind of give a, I just say, a, a hard definition as to uh, what makes, uh, uh, what makes such a, a team work. But I'd say this, like if uh, if someone is is wondering right now if they they should um, uh, found a business with their spouse or with their husband, uh, I think the first rule is if you want to do it, it's usually a good sign. I mean, just do it. <laughs> um, but I'd say there are three red flags that where you should not do it if you have that. So. Uh, one uh, would be if you can't disagree in public, you know, if you feel it hinders your couple to uh, disagree in front of others, then don't uh, found a company together. Uh, if also you feel it hurts your couple to not be able to like show signs of affection in public, don't found a company together. And also if um, you, you also need to be the kind of person where it's just a fact like you're constantly really passionate and talking all the time about what you do at work and what motivates you and then do this is a, a really good sign that you should found a company together because all those conversations you might as well be talking about the same business <laughs> you have a, a return on the time spent talking about work uh, if it's on the same venture uh, so that's usually a really good sign that you should found a business together it's also a great way i know that from personal experience to never stop working because essentially you there's always a topic to speak about even after work uh that means that that you can talk about these things very very um wonderful i i i thank you for that advice i will help uh people out there um I, I appreciate you guys coming on the show. This was super, super helpful. Um, where can people find more about you, about Menutech, uh, get in touch with you? So you can follow us on Twitter and LinkedIn. You can follow Menutech on Twitter and LinkedIn. Uh, and for us, usually uh, we're very accessible uh, if you invite us for a coffee. <laughs> uh, so you gotta buy tickets to you. Gotta buy a ticket. <laughs> <laughs> we are foodies, so we are like hardcore foodies and tech techies. So I mean, if you tempt us with conversations about tech or about food, uh, we'll be there. <laughs> Awesome. Thank you so much and uh, speak soon. Speak soon. Thank you.